like to uh, to talk a little bit about work uh, on big data and democracy. I should mention that this work uh, a couple of years ago received funding from the Data Science Center Tilburg. So and now you see what you get. Um, the this is joint work with uh, Freik van Gils, who's a PhD student right now and whose uh, PhD position was partly funded with this money, and my dear colleague uh, Vivian Miller at the University of Vienna and uh, also here. So. so Democracy, big data, um, social media. Since 2016, at the latest, so since the, the US presidential elections uh, that led to the, uh, to the election of Trump, uh, and since Brexit, kind of had been accusations that social media would actually foster disinformation to be uh, kind of transmitted to voters, such that uh, they would make actually election decisions uh, that are not in their own interest. So thereby, that social media and the type of information that would be provided by social media would manipulate election, uh, elections, democratic elections, which can lead to several problems. This only did not have, uh, this did not only happen in 2016, but uh, this is a picture from last week actually, where kind of uh, a whistleblower from Facebook, Francis Hogan, uh, kind of who worked at Facebook uh, for long, kind of uh, gave testimony to the US uh, Congress and uh, kind of revealed uh, many in uh, internal documents uh, of Facebook. And one of the things she brought, she brought up is that uh, she claimed that uh, actually the algorithms that Facebook use uh, to distribute news and also political news would damage democracy. So these are serious accusations. Right? Now, where's the problem? The problem starts with the fact that actually we know right now that more than 50% of online news con uh, will be consumed by algorithm-driven platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, and uh, also Google News as a main source of political information, right? So it's not the old TV, it's not the, uh, it's not newspapers anymore. It's, it's uh, social media basically, which are the main source of political information for many people, not about only about their friends and their pets. Now we also know that some ideologically motivated information suppliers, of which we will call interest groups, disseminate disinformation on these platforms for several purposes. And so the, uh, the two key uh, problems that have been mentioned in the literature and partly that we uh, kind of also worked on theoretically in, in previous work are the, on the one hand side, the obfuscation of origin of news items. This basically means if you, if you get a news item on, on social media, very often you only know, oh, I saw it on Facebook, but you do not recall who is the original sender because kind of that's, that's not made so prominent. And uh, the second major problem that has been mentioned is the uh, kind of technological ability of micro-targeting ad services, which implies that you get a different ad or you see different news than your neighbor because your neighbor has different characteristics and made different choices online. Right? So where's the true problem? The true problem is if it is correct that, uh, that uh, there is disinformation, that disinformation can affect people's voting behavior, then in the end, we could, uh, we, uh, this could undermine trust and democracy. Because if we think that the person who just officially won an election and is not what, uh, again, representing the will of the people, then why trust the results of election? So that's, that's the main problem. Now, Based on, on uh, this research kind of by several people like kind of beforehand, uh, some reform proposals have been proposed. For instance, by the European Commission in what they call the European Democracy Action Plan. And so the two, two key reform proposals here on the one hand side are to introduce mandatory disclosure rules for social media, such that kind of the, uh, the origin of political content must be made more transparent. And secondly, uh, the, uh, that, that micro-targeting technology should be more restricted. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's basically in the political discussion. But now, and this is very interesting, so these are, two, uh, these are two quotes from political scientists, and Josh Tucker is a pretty prominent one. Uh, so and they wrote, uh, well, we are concerned that reliance on untested conventional wisdom based on folk theories of technology's impact on democracy is leading to misguided reform proposals that may even worse the problems they attempt to solve. So we just saw in the previous slide that kind of policymakers are taking action, but they do not really know whether the action is warranted or not and whether it goes in the right direction because there is not free really empirical evidence. And why is there not so much evidence? That's kind of where the second, uh, kind of the second quotation here comes in because kind of personally and Tucker write that uh, it remains the case 
that the employees of the platforms are the only ones who really know the scale of the problems I attribute to them. Those of us, we poor researchers, those of us on the outside must make do with the glimpses provided through publicly available data, which may or may not uh, paint an accurate picture. Right? So that's the problem. We need to know, kind of, we need to get some empirics about what actually is going on. And this is where we try to contribute a little bit. So what we, uh, what we try to, to answer is a research question that says whether, so we want to study these two technologies mentioned. And so can a ban on micro-targeting and or mandatory disclosure of interest by uh, senders of political messages, can this avoid election rigging and improve voters' welfare? So that's the, the overarching question. And how do we operationalize that basically in the lab? So we go to the lab, we create our own uh, kind of, uh, we create our own data. Um, before that kind of uh, the experiment is uh, very well informed, we, can, uh, we, we first construct the game theoretic model, making clear who has what kind of incentives. And, uh, and so why would we then do this in the lab? Well, first to get, uh, to get the data about uh, human decisions in, in, kind of in online environments uh, uh, about political elections in the first place. But in particular, that's a nice thing, of course, about lab experiments, you can control everything, right? So we do not kind of, we do not have the external validity that you do if you do have actual Facebook data, but uh, we can control everything. And so at least we have complete internal validity and, uh, and then we can discuss external validity. Right? Now, um, I will not go into too much detail about what, uh, how exactly it looks like, but I, will, I want to give you a glimpse about these, uh, about these uh, experiments. So basically we have subjects, so that's the students usually, uh, and they are matched in groups of four. And in each group, kind of you would have one person taking over the role of the interest group, as sending a political message, and you would have three people who receive such a message, and they take on the, the role of voter, they, they, they get a message about the state of the world, and we're here kind of in the model, kind of that the state of the world can be one or two. Think about state of the world one could be something like a more leftist policy is more appropriate. State of the world two is a more right wing popular uh, policy is more appropriate. Ex ante, we don't. Right? So the, the assumption is that the interest group sees what is actually the best, but the interest group has an own incentive because it belongs to one of two types. It's either what we call majority or what we call minority. And depending on the state of the world and its type, it prefers one of two parties, X or Y. And uh, then basically the interest group sends this message, oh, the state of the world is this or that, and this is cheap talk. So it can be pure lie or it can be truthful. And it sends this to, to the voters. The voters see it. The voters also have a, a kind of have a, have a type. So two of them are majority, one is minority. And then they make a kind of, a, they make a voting decision. And uh, the party that collects the most votes wins, very, as, as it's uh, supposed to be in a democracy. Right. Now, kind of where, where's the interesting part? The interesting part is basically here, because we study on the one hand side games with public communication, think a newspaper or a TV. So in this uh, kind of in this case, the interest group can, can choose only one message and all of the voters see the same message and they know that they see the same message, right? You read the moon newspaper and you know that your neighbor reads exactly the same piece. Alternatively, there is micro-targeted uh, kind of news dissemination, which implies, oh, it's possible that you see something different than your neighbor because you're majority, he's minority or the other way around, right? And you know that. And secondly, the question is, well, do you know the identity of the sender? For instance, oh yeah, this message came from a majority interest group. Ah, I have some guess what they want me to do. Consequently, I can, I can make a kind of a, I can update my beliefs, right? And in this case, this would be disclosed identity of the sender. Otherwise, we also check what's going on if, if they just don't know. So as in social media, right? So. All of this was implemented in Vienna, actually, uh, with my co-author. Um, due to Corona, it took a pretty long time, so uh, October 2020 until July 21. So we, we ran, in total, we ran 36 sessions with 432 subjects. And importantly, I should mention in this kind of interdisciplinary environment, this was an economic seminar, uh, an economics, uh, sorry, uh, experiment, which implies the uh, decisions were incentivized. So uh, the students on average made 40 euros uh, for two and a half hours, but actually if they made smarter decisions, they would make more money. And if they made, uh, made not so smart decisions, they would make less. Right? So that's, uh, that's the game. Um, we have some measures for uh, kind of the outcome measures for individual and aggregate efficiency, that's not so important. 
But then actually what we did is that we, we first started kind of in one game, uh, which is, uh, we call it MU here, which stands for micro-targeting and undisclosed. So that's actually think of current social media. So where you, the micro-targeting exists and you do not know as a, as a voter actually who's sending your message. And then we study kind of starting from here, um, what happens if we introduce a ban on micro-targeting, if this is not happening anymore, and what happens if we mandatorily kind of disclose the, the interest of the sender or both? So that's basically part one of the game. Part two of the game, here we, we change position and we basically try to uh, restructure the development of the media industry. So we start in the good old times when we had newspapers. So that would be the public game with disclosure of interest. And then we check what's going on if micro-targeting is possible and if, if instantaneously kind of these groups uh, types are not, are not revealed. Yet. Now, what do we find? We have two major findings, basically. The first is, well, as long as games are public, again, think newspapers, as long as games are public, then there is no major difference in the average individual efficiency of both minority and, and majority voters. So that's, uh, that's basically, that's okay. However, as soon as micro-targeting is, in, is included, so where set messages can be customized to the type of the receiver, then this is a problem for minority voters, not for majority voters. Where's the intuition? The intuition is that with two thirds uh, probability, kind of the sender is of majority type by definition, that's majority. And so majority interest groups have an incentive to report truthfully if they send a message to majority receivers, majority voters. And then kind of, uh, which is why they, why they report truthfully in the first sense. And then kind of despite the fact that they are not really keen on it, but they, they also have to report truthfully to minority voters, right? So that's in, the, in a newspaper kind of minority voters also know I get correct news and then I can update my own beliefs. I can make my thoughts about uh, what is correct and what is my uh, kind of in my own interest and I can make a voting decision. However, as soon as uh, kind of micro-targeting is possible, this, this discipline effect of public communications technology falls away. That's what we kind of predicted theoretically and that's also what we see in the data. And that's a pretty clear result. Micro-targeting is bad for minority. Second major thing, um, uh, we found that the micro if we ban micro-targeting, this alone has no significant effect for majority and minority voters. However, disclosure is the elephant in the room. So if we force the uh, kind of uh, social media to disclose the interests of, of a message sender, then this will have positive effects in particular for majority voters. And if we combine kind of this disclosure with, uh, with uh, a ban on micro-targeting, it will have positive effect actually for both majority and minority voters, right? So that's, uh, that's basically the uh, second major, uh, major message here. If we combine kind of a, a prohibition of uh, micro-targeting and we, uh, we ask them to disclose kind of the, the identity of the senders, then uh, this will be positive for everybody. If I conclude, so what we uh, what I presented here is basically the first systematic evaluation of the effect of a micro-targeting ban and mandatory disclosure of interest on voting behavior. Um, our experiment suggests that disclosure of interest is crucial to enhance the efficiency of voter decision making, and uh, the micro-targeting ban enhances the efficiency of voting actions by minority voters, but only in combination with mandatory disclosure. Thank you very much. Thank you.